Good morning, brethren. It's a great blessing to gather with you. This much anticipated uh, meeting today. We have prayed and prayed and prayed. We've given much attention uh, over the weeks uh, to preparation, uh, every kind of preparation for our gathering here. And uh, the time has arrived. Uh, we are grateful to God for his protection. We've especially prayed for those of you who have traveled miles and miles to be with us uh, for God's care and provision. Uh, we regret that some dear ones that have been with us many years in the past are not able to be with us uh, today, but we're grateful. Uh, we know they're here in spirit. Uh, we hope that they're able to join us on live stream. We welcome any who, are, who have joined us on live stream this morning. And uh, we anticipate good things from God. All, of his th all that he provides for us is good. All that he's made known to us is good. Uh, we want to handle it rightly. Uh, we want to joy and rejoice in it. Uh, we want to drink fully and deeply of the good things that God provides for us and uh, sit eagerly. Uh, I can tell by uh, your faces and your eyes, your anticipation of these good things. I'm grateful uh, that I have not had laid, that I have not had laid upon me the responsibility to deliver everything this morning, even though I'm the first speaker. Uh, I'm confident uh, that all of the brethren, all of those who speak, uh, will each add to uh, our exposition of the truth as we develop these things of the identity and relevance of the gospel. Uh, this morning, from this text, as you can tell from the text itself, uh, we'll give primary attention to the identity, the identity of the gospel that God has made known to us. As far as we can tell, now we don't know for certain, the Apostle Paul had not been in Colossae. Now he knew Philemon and Aphia and Archippus who lived in Colossae. Uh, but as far as we know from some extra biblical records, uh, Paul himself had not been there. It's likely, it's likely that these believers heard the gospel while Paul was in Ephesus during that two year period where Brother Luke records for us that all Asia heard the word. And so the word went to Colossae through uh, Brother Epaphras. And he was faithful in his delivery of it. These brethren clave to the Lord and drew near to him. They were eager to hear and understand. In fact, part of the reason the brother uh, Paul had to write to them was that they were so eager to hear that some, some false teachers came in among them and they, and they were listening to them. And so he had to write to correct some of the things that had been said that, were, that, were, uh, that had the potential of steering them off course and uh, skewing their perception and their understanding, their vision of the things that God had made known. And so the words that he writes here, especially in the introduction here, is intended to, to narrow their focus. Of course, now, in our culture, the ungodly and unbelieving think that's a wretched thing, don't they? To narrow your focus? Yeah. But we know better than that. We would have our focus narrowed to things above, things not seen. For we know that those things are what we're being prepared for, and those are part of what God will use to prepare us for them. Those very things God will use, our perception of them, our grasp of them, God will use to prepare us to actually obtain and take hold of them when we enter in and uh, enjoy his presence. Brethren, we want to take up the text then here. In fact, I'm going to read the first eight verses because I want to uh, focus like a laser beam our attention on these things. Paul, Colossians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to these saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope 
which is laid up for you in heaven. Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it has in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned it of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Get the focus of those words, brethren? <laughs> that word, the, is pretty big, isn't it? How many times? I didn't count how many times there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 times the apostle uses that little focus word, that definitive word, the. See, that clarifies our scope, if you want to say it that way, so that our attention will not be distracted, so that we, it, it will be clear, eminently clear, what we're talking about here, see? That's especially important, particularly important for our generation when there are so many distractions everywhere. Eyes, ears, distractions, constant distractions through the media, yeah, our transportation system, the communication systems, and so forth. So, by the way, I hope you have your cell phone turned off this morning. We don't want that kind of distraction. The informs us of something definite. Specific, narrow, confined, even constrictive. Look at this. Listen to this. That's the idea, see? Don't be distracted over here. Now look, look right here. See, that's the whole idea. The word of the truth of the gospel. Americans are particularly uh, guilty and accustomed and demanding of being able to make their own choices. To uh, have their own appetites satisfied from an abundance. All kinds of choices. And they glory in those things, both the opportunity, the options, the power to make those choices, the freedom and rights to make those choices, they glory in all of those things. And this is why many, though they may be glad to have a form of religion, they're not interested in the power, the power that brings us to God and establishes us in that way and continues and maintains us in that way to the goal. They're not interested in that because obviously that precludes, that cuts off most all of those options. It just does. In some sense, it cuts off everyone, every option when you deny yourself. Because the Lord didn't say deny yourself things, did he? He said deny yourself. See, it goes right to the kernel, right to the beginning point. Deny yourself. Now, that, of course, will involve denying yourself things. But it's because you've denied yourself. And Americans are just not interested in that. In fact, flesh is not interested in that, is it? Never has been. Never has been. Even those who, uh, you know, some of the audience, some of the readers, so some of the hearers, some of the hearers or readers, if this, if, if this letter was written and, and or as this letter was written and likely read in public in the assembly, some of those hearers would have been slaves. Onesimus was, wasn't he? Would have been slaves. They were not accustomed to having a multitude of choices and options. Not at all. And yet the flesh finds a way, doesn't it? <laughs> It seeks and finds a way, you know, like the, like the, uh, like the trapped wild animal. Boy, you, you're trying to 
keep or get a wild animal in a cage, you better make sure you got it secure because if there's a way out of there, they will find it, won't they? They will search and search and search and practically and sometimes will kill themselves trying to get out of that thing. That's the way the flesh is. That's the way the flesh is. So, definitive, spe specificity, narrowness, con to the point of constrictiveness, being confined in a straight course. That's what the word the is about here. It brings our attention, as opposed to words like a or any. You know, a word, a truth, any truth, any gospel, a gospel. See the difference? It's, it's an extreme difference, isn't it? If you think about it. I trust that you are thinking about it. We need more people to think about it, huh? We're not talking about random here. We're not talking about meandering or accidental or happenstance or chances here. The word, the truth, the gospel. That's what they'd heard. That's what produced in them these things, bringeth forth fruit. As in all the world, is producing what God intends. The seed is the word of God, the master said, didn't he? That is broadcast, that is spread out. It is cast everywhere. There's no place where their word has not gone. The psalm says. So let's give attention to these things then. These phrases in particular. The word. The truth. And the gospel. The phrase the word is used 144 times. In the Gospels, the book of Acts, and the epistles. 144 times. 44 times in the Gospels where it's introduced. It's introduced to us. The Apostle Paul uses it 43 times in his writings. James and Peter use it eight times. And the Apostle John in his short letter and Revelation uses it 11 more times. So, and the only two times... The only two times where the word, there's only two times out of all of those times where it does not refer either to the words of our Savior, the word of God, or something directly connected to that. There's only two times. Those two times is as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, that is the word of the messengers who came to tell Jairus, your daughter is dead, don't bother the teacher anymore. And the other time was Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians 2, where he makes this reference that you received our message not as the word of men. Every other time, every other time, this word is very specific, or this phrase, this word, the word, is very specific. The only way you could mistake it or get off course is if you're just not paying attention. Or you just don't care. You have no interest in what it has to say. A person is like the path where the word lies on the surface and is taken away by the devil. The birds of the air eat it up and it's gone. That's the only way you could miss this focus if you give attention to this, pardon me, to this phrase, the word. Some of the ways you all, you all know. I, I know that as I speak that, that your minds have, have your, your fertile minds, fertile in the word and the scripture and cultivated by the spirit of God. Uh, you've been thinking of different texts already uh, of the revelation that God has made to us of himself and his son. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh. This is the preeminent revelation that uses this phrase. The word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Then years later, sometime later, 
The Apostle John echoes those words, or we might say expounds those words, that thought. And at the same time, he makes some application of it and talks about his experience. You're familiar with these words, where he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon with our hands, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifest, and we have seen it. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life. That, by the way, is just another focus word, isn't it? That eternal life. Let's see. This then is the message. The word this is another focus word. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light in him. There's no darkness at all. And Peter echoes, we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we, made known, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now that's just a, just a, a, a taste, a little taste of the way the apostles used this phrase, this focus word. None knew the Father but the Son, or the Son but the Father. They made themselves known. The Father made the Son known. The Son made the Father known to those chosen beforehand. Remember the Savior's words there? Simon, son of John, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. The Apostle Paul would later echo these words, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, of course, was not, a, not an eyewitness of his majesty in those things. The Lord revealed it to him later. Uh, according to his purpose for Paul, rise and stand on thy feet. I've appeared to thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and those things to which I will appear unto thee. Brother, now this, this goes right to the phrase, the word. These are the men who delivered this word to us. The exposition of this gospel. They are the ones who opened it up, primarily the Apostle Paul. Opened it these things to us, made them clear, ex expanded our perception of them as the Spirit uh, directed them in these things that had been made known to them by the Lord Jesus himself. Words, words, a message from God through Jesus Christ, delivered to chosen witnesses, words to be spoken of men, chosen witnesses. In the wisdom of God, this is how God worked. This is what he planned. It's not random. It's not uh, trial and error. It's not by chance or let's see what happens and we'll just adapt as we go along. This is what God chose to do. And so he managed the circumstances. He directed the people, and the primary people were, by the way, chosen by him and willing, yielded to conform themselves, giving up every other thing. Lord, we've given up all to follow you. What shall be for us? Remember, they, they knew what they had done. They recognized this. Some gave up their businesses and careers. They all did to some extent. Some gave up their families, likely. We don't know the details, but we know the course of these things, don't we? Some of you have had to give up your families. Some of you have had to give up careers and plans that you may have had or someone may have had for you, but when you heard the call, when you heard the call, see, you had to abandon those things and follow after the Master. For after that, in the wisdom of God, that is following the wisdom of God, according to the wisdom of God, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. He cut off every access to himself and the knowledge of these things, except by the word of the truth 
of the gospel. See, it pleased God by the, and God always gets what pleases him. No one denies him. No one. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believed. Now, the foolishness of this preaching is particularly, Paul's already defined it back in verse 18, the preaching of the cross. That's the foolishness of this preaching. The word is a primary instrument of God's power in this matter, the power of God unto salvation. So the witnesses preached the word to be heard by men, a message of conviction for the heart and the mind of the mighty works of God that he had accomplished in his son and was now going out by the superintendence and shepherding of the spirit under the direction of the great shepherd of the sheep. He was directing these things. He knew what was happening. He knew what was going on. He was directing. The Spirit of Jesus told them not to go to one place. The Spirit told them, don't go this way. And so they continued on to Troas, where they had the vision of the man from Macedonia. See? God's superintending. They're, they're not, it's, it's not left to men. It wasn't left to Peter, Andrew, James, and John. It wasn't left to Paul and Barnabas and Silas. God directed. And they were willing to be directed. They were directable. See? Even as are we. So as they went and spoke these things, here's a good digest of their message. Taken from Acts chapter 10, you're familiar with the text. Peter speaking, We are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Now, that's, that's a pretty good digest. And it comes in many forms. It wasn't a formula. We know this. It wasn't a formula. They declared it, the things that they knew, the facts that they knew. They knew the facts. They were there, especially the Apostle John. He was there. He heard the words that the Master uttered from the cross. He saw how they treated him. He heard the words of the enemies, of the priests and the scribes. Their jeering and their taunting. He heard those things. Peter heard. He wasn't there at the cross himself, but he heard all the others. In fact, Peter, James, and John heard things the others did not hear, didn't they? God makes certain choices. We shouldn't be surprised. Not at all. Nor, and, and there's certainly no room for jealousy and some kind of territorial uh, attitude among believers. In another place, the Apostle Paul stated it this way, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you the word, the word, the word of this salvation is sent. This word, he spoke those words there in the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia. Stirred up the whole city. The whole place gathered by the next Sabbath to hear these things that were spoken by Paul and Barnabas. You can imagine how the president of that synagogue was treated after that. Why did you invite those men to speak in the first place? Because the Jews' jealousy was stirred up. No one was paying attention to their words and their teaching as they did these strangers from Jerusalem. But of course, they had, a, they had a message that was directed by God as a fulfillment. And, and these Jews refused, most of the Jews, most of the Jews refused to see the fulfillment of these things, of this word. They had the word of God, but they refused its fulfillment. It's ours, and we're not going to let anybody, even God, take it from us. Now, they wouldn't have said that, of course, but that was their attitude, wasn't it? We're going to sit right down here in this wet concrete and not move. 
See? And whoever did so didn't move. They were abandoned there, frozen, unable to move. This message then sifted the hearts. This word sifted the hearts of all the hearers. Some responded to that truth favorably. Others responded unfavorably, but all responded. All responded. See, some folks don't understand. You will make a decision. Some may urge people to make a decision. You don't, uh, we're talking about different kinds of decisions here, of course, you understand. But everyone who hears this will make a decision. Some will say, what, 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 what? Did, did you see that car go by? Or did you hear that? You know, some respond that way. Others will say, we want to hear more of these things. Some will scoff. What's this? Idle words, idle babblers. What's this guy talking about anyway? We've never heard that before. And others will say, we've not heard that before and I want to hear it. See, every, every kind of reaction, every kind of reaction to the word that was sent from God. Of course, we understand that at the beginning it was a person. It was a person. And then it was expounded. His person was expounded. We're not, we're not talking about a religious system here. Methodology and not at all. The person of our Savior was expounded. Expound the word of the truth, which, as the Apostle Paul says, was manifest in the flesh. By the way, this phrase, the truth, is used 62 times in the writings of the Gospels and the letters, including James and 1 Peter and 1 John. The truth. The Apostle Paul uses it 47 times. The truth manifest in the flesh, first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, cultured for centuries by the word of God, the word of God. They were cultured to hear these things. The Savior said, the scriptures testify of me. We have found, and what did Andrew say? We have found him of whom the law and the prophets wrote, even Jesus of Nazareth. We have found him. Philip said that to the brother as well. So cultured for centuries. By the word of God. And then they had this testimony. In their cities and villages, streets and roads, the testimony of him. You remember the day the funeral was proceeding out of the city of Nain and he and his disciples just came walking down the road. No one paid attention to these strangers coming into the village. They were busy with something important. And then one of them reached out and touched the body. You can imagine that some in the crowd were horrified at that. How? Who? Not only is he a stranger, he touched the body. Well, it was only a few minutes before they had a different reaction, wasn't it? Yeah. Because they had the testimony. They themselves saw. God has visited his people. That was the only explanation. It was their, that were their words. They didn't know who this man was who the crowd around him was, the other men. They didn't know them. They had this testimony. Peter was able to say, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves know. Those were very convicting words, see. As ye yourselves know. This truth, see it was truth. The facts. 
the events that took place. Him being delivered by determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Those were all facts. They knew that. Those who had been in Jerusalem knew those facts or had heard them. What they didn't know was this. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. That's what they didn't know. See, this was the truth. This expounded truth that was now being set before them. Boldly, the only evidence was the preaching of it. They didn't have the shroud, sorry, for those who search for such things. No physical evidence, unless you want to call Peter and John's eyes physical evidence because they went to the tomb and saw that he was not there, didn't they? And they had eaten and drank with him. So some might say that was physical evidence, but it was, according to human estimation, it was of a lesser nature. I hear on a regular basis, especially because of my police work, how uh, eyewitnesses are not trustworthy testimonies. Isn't that interesting that the world would bring that up and posit that? Forth. Eyewitness testimonies are not trustworthy. Hmm, hmm. Well, that's true in some cases on a horizontal level. We all know that. Our spouses, we tell each other that, don't we? <laughs> huh? About certain things. No, that's not what really happened. Or no, that you didn't see that. Or you didn't see that? You were looking right at it. You didn't see that. It was laying right there. So we know how our, our own nature is like that to some degree. But that's, a, that's on a human level. That's horizontal, see. These are things that have been made known from above. This is not a human testimony. It's not just a record of earthly events. Not at all. He was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. That's the sense in which it's not just a, an earthly human record. He was justified in the spirit. He did the work of his father. The spirit directed these things. These were things that were testified to in the law and the prophets, the things that he did. Again and again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record, this is what was spoken. This even as the prophet Isaiah said, even as the psalm said, see, David said this, they refer to him again and again and again. He exercised powers that none could deny. They couldn't deny there was power there. The only question is, what's the source? What's the source? He made statements of profound truth. And ultimately, he was declared with power to be the Son of God through the resurrection of the dead, justified in the spirit, seen of angels. This truth is seen of angels who long to look into these things, who desire, desire to know, who desire to witness of these things, who desire to engage these things. They, they themselves ministered to him at key times, didn't they? And two of them we're in the tomb. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen as he said. Behold, he goes before you into Galilee. Seen among angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. The promise was, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed, the prophet Malachi said, from the rising of the sun even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered unto my name, a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Stunning, stunning to these Jewish brethren. 
The disciples, they were willing, but it was not of themselves, was it? It was not of themselves. No. God directed them. And as soon as Peter saw it, not so, Lord. Nothing unclean's ever entered my mouth. Call not unclean what God hath cleansed. Immediately, he was willing. Someone's knocking at the door. I have sent them. You go with them. Peter entered the house with witnesses, by the way. He knew the weight of this, culturally speaking, religiously speaking. So he had witnesses. Now I know of a truth, he said. God is no respecter of persons. Beware misusing that phrase. People will twist that phrase to justify every kind of sordid behavior and conduct in our current generation. That God is no respecter of persons. That's not how Peter used that phrase. Don't be stealing his words. So the apostles reported the reality of his identity and his works in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. The, they, they themselves were fully persuaded. They laid down their lives. Beat us, if you will. You decide whether it is right for us to obey you rather than God. We cannot help but speak the things that we have seen. So they offered themselves and fully declared this message to any who would give them a hearing, public or private. Preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world. They that gladly received his word were baptized. A great company of priests were obedient to the faith. A great number believed and turned to the Lord in Antioch of Syria. Paul describes its transmission with these phrases. In all the world, preached to every creature, appeared to all men, that by me the preaching might be fully known everywhere. He didn't hesitate to go anywhere. He'd go right back into the bowels of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. For the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am called into question, he said to them. Many of them whom he personally knew. Some whom he likely worked for and worked with in the past. And he stood there like a lion among those who only thought they were lions. And fearlessly stated this truth. They knew what he meant by that. They were the ones whom years before had threatened and warned and beaten the others, commanded that they be beat for preaching this message. Some of them, perhaps there were some of them who had stood there, as did Paul, when our brother Stephen was taken and witnessed the first one to give himself for this truth, the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Enemies themselves testified that this message turned the world upside down, didn't they? At the end of Paul's letter to Philippi, he sent them greetings from the believers in Caesar's household. See, it had gone everywhere. Everywhere, received up into glory, the Savior pleased his Father in all things that he did. This was the promise that Peter cited from the words of David on the very first proclamation of this gospel. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So here's the application that Peter made. Let, therefore, all the house of Israel know assuredly See, that connects right to the truth. Assuredly, that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The word of the truth. A reality, even in human terms, it was a reality. See, that's what the truth is. This is the way things really are. This is what really happened, what men could see. They proclaimed up to a point, and then after that, they were proclaiming the reality that only God had done and could reveal. 
and in which he would work. The word of the truth of the gospel, this phrase then, is a uniquely biblical phrase. Eighty-six times this text is used. This phrase is used. Twenty times in the gospels where it's introduced. Sixty-two times in the writings of our brother Paul. Sixty-two times. And then Paul uses it four times. I'm sorry, Peter uses it four times in his first letter. So our brother Paul was the expounder and the expositor of this phrase, the gospel. Good news. Good news from God. That Jesus of Nazareth pleased, pleased God in all things while upon the earth. And men could hear this. And know that God was pleased with his son. And that God had granted all judgment to him. That all may honor the son even as they honor the father. That God's great day of judgment is now appointed. And Jesus of Nazareth will administer it. He is the only name. His is the only name. Which is given for salvation. From God's wrath. That comes upon the world. The only hope of escape. The only refuge from what God himself is bringing upon this world. It's revealed, in, it revealed, this gospel revealed the power and wisdom of God. That power in the sense of it being calculated to save. At the beginning, of course, is power created. And at critical times, his power destroyed. Now. His power is calculated in this gospel itself, which is the message of and about and through his son to save men's souls and to prepare us for his presence. Unsearchable, unknowable things of the destruction of the enemy of our soul and the plundering of his kingdom and his possessions. Even in weakness, even in weakness, the Savior did these things. Amen. But he's not weak anymore. Amen. His name, just his name, saves. The power that purges the heart of sin and gives life injects life into the yielding soul and heart, granting then wisdom to hear and see and understand the things that God has made known to rise and walk in the light and life that's been made known in the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. This reconciliation that God has sent to us as the prophet Isaiah spoke of, in the first chapter, verses 16 through 20, he removed the enmity of sin in a man who was sent to do this work. Well, God even used the enemy of our soul as an instrument and a tool and part of this work. Enabling us to reason with and find rest in God's truth and cease from our own labors and to put our hand to his labors by faith. All of these things, all of these things are contained in the person of Jesus of Nazareth from Galilee, the Son of the Blessed One, the Holy One sent from God, who brought life and immortality to light, who is the yes and amen of the promises of God the first and the last of all things that pertain to God, who himself holds the keys of death and hell and the grave, who will judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. The word of the truth of the gospel. Not else will achieve God's intended work. No other hope will stand in the light of God's piercing 
presence and the judgment of the Son. No other word, no other truth is good news. Pleasing God in all things. God's grace and peace to you, brother.